Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Tales for Gamers and one and one of the three head one head one head of the triple headed monster that is currently developing medieval tales from Europe, a more a more grounded take on Five E's setup. The one and only Andrea Onilla. I'm hoping I got it right. <laughs> yeah, it is. How are you doing, Hi, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. What about you? Thanks for uh, for this introduction and for having me in this episode. Yeah, thank thank you for coming on and for braving the hell of time zones. Yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that was a problem. <laughs> we managed it. Well, it's it's a it's a problem, but if, if there's a silver lining to it, it's no one's unique with the problem. Hmm. Yep, exactly. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Hmm. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Yeah. Yeah, so basically I've always been very interested in, uh, in writing and, and reading. So I'm talking about common... Uh, common books and, and, and novels, and then I got close to the role-playing games uh, thanks to a friend. So one day I just started rolling dice, and uh, and I remember I was uh, love at first sight, and especially I remember that I wanted to be the the DM, the dungeon master, in case the, we were playing D and D at the time uh, in the second session. Like you know what, I want to be a DM. <laughs> I don't want to play as a player. Um, yeah, so I, I remember that the sensation was the the huge possibility to link uh, the writing that I always been doing before with the fact that I could bring people into my stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I could write actually stories that people not just re uh, read but also take part personally. Um, and this was actually the, the 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 love for the role playing games. So I can write things and I can bring people in it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, were you which um which edition which edition of D and D did you did you get introduced through? Was it through fifth or or yeah. was it through an earlier one? No, no, I started with the three point five. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which was probably something like fifteen years ago. So I started with the three the three point five, um, and and then I moved later on on other role playing games. Uh, like uh, Alien or also Cthulhu, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, in that period, I also got a bit away from the D and D world. And then I came back with the fifth edition, that I personally find uh, very elegant and light, especially for the new players. Uh, it really um, get my job easier when I have to introduce it to new uh, players, especially my my nephews, for example. They are they are kids and um, they are very uh, they get into the fifth edition quite easily. Um, and this may also, I think, the fifth edition. This is the great potential of the fifth edition, and not only the, the not the only one. But yeah, uh, so 3.5, then I moved on other RPGs and then back to the 5th edition. And now I am kind of sticking on it. But uh, this is just related to me, myself, in the in, in the team. Probably the other two members, they also play other games. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about Medieval. Yeah. Um, was, 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 it something that's, was it something that started just as a collection of house rules or how did it come about initially hmm. yeah so the the, ga the the project started with uh, basically um, quite naturally while playing dnd &D. and uh, that's all that's all I always say dnd &D came before even middle ages was there in the sense that we were playing dnd &D, and um, i generally when i when i play dnd &D, i always uh, like to use uh, for the most part, the, the elements of realism. So I'm talking about uh, taking care of your journey. So you prepare your stuff, you take care of your equipment, 
or for example the brawl and all those mechanics that are already there i'm talking about realistic mechanics that are already in dnd but then playing uh dnd i figured out that most of these mechanics get in a way um Get get removed in a way. They they become less important when the magic strikes in, uh, from the second or the third level. Come an object, they don't matter anymore. Or even uh, I have a sword, but uh, I, I can deal more damage with enchantments and, and so on. And in that point, I realized that I really liked to play more the first level, the first and the second level, for example, uh, of my character. And 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 then I realized, okay, you know what? I would like to. To, to transform this game in, some, in something more realistic. Uh, and then I realized that basically D&D is Middle Ages. It's, just, it's a fantasy Middle Ages version, but Middle Ages is there. It's already there. So in the ele- um, element of realism also are there in a, in, a, in a way. So why not to try to give those elements more space uh, and, uh, and transform this fifth edition in something which is more realistic and coming into the Middle Ages, even historical. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, that kind of con- that kind of concept is in good company, um, since that whole that whole thing of wanting to lean more lean more into Middle Ages is how chivalry and sorcery got got its start. Uh, sorry, you say it again. Um. Oh. The the idea exactly. the idea of add of adding of adding more history into D and D has a established tradition. Hmm. Um, I e it's not the it's not the first time that somebody's looked at D and D and wanted to, and wanted to do that. Um, yeah, some that was done with A D and D, which is what led to um, chivalry and sorcery. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, but in a way, I think also think there was always. Uh, a kind of resistance to it uh, because of the complexity of the matter. In this case, we're talking about almost 1,000 years of history, and uh, and clearly that w- it's not an easy task to put everything in a, in a new setting. So probably this was the big the big uh, um, thing to overcome. What do you think? Well, when it comes to when it comes to D and D and setting, the qu- the question I always end up asking is what setting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in this case, yeah, <laughs> we're talking about fifth edition. But uh, let's say more than a setting, it was hard to to bring the history in a game, in a game table where, where you can basically use all the elements of a thousand year history. Yeah, that, that was a challenge. <laughs> that I can see. I can see that as a big. I can see that as a bigger challenge, mm-hmm. if if only because when you're de- when you're dealing with implement with implementing history in that regard depending on how far you're going in you can re- mm. you can um you can have some degree of lockout mm. um yeah because not e- not everybody is going to be a scholar yeah yeah true true this also means you expose yourself and eventually you will get those scholar on your game and they would have something to say that's for sure Mm-hmm. But uh, a game is a game, and yeah. uh, you, in a way or another, you have to accept some approximations. Um, and the, the the challenge is to approximate mm-hmm. in the good way. Yeah, I um, I have a, I have a philosophy that I call believability over realism. Hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Realism as an absolute goal is some is something that is is almost unattainable, and if you, and if one were to do so, um, the game part of it would end up Just being disappear. eaten. Would end up being eaten away. Yeah. Um, and it's for the, and um, even w- even with that, there's still when you're trying when you're trying to put in the fantastical elements of a fantasy game. Obviously, you can't go a whole lot of realism with that. So believability mm-hmm. is meant as kind of a balancing act. Yeah, that's exactly how uh, medieval works. You know, I'm talking about our setting. Mm-hmm. Um, it, when, when you say realism, there are people that ask, okay, why this weapon is not exactly 25 centimeter as the archaeologists archaeologists say? I mean, uh, there is realism and there is real life. So sometimes I always say it's a more realistic setting than D&D. Um, mm-hmm. 
it's more safe ground. But that's, of course, uh, it also depends on, on what people is expecting from it. Uh, I understand that there are people that are expecting, it's, it's, uh, they, they expect uh, more accurate historical details, and we did mm -hmm. our best with uh, with, uh, with the historians and, and with professional people that are not ourselves, because we know something about Middle Ages, but, mm -hmm. but there are people that know more. So we did a very good job on that, but for sure, there would be super small details that some scholar in the world would notice um, and they would might maybe inquire, oh, this is realistic, we've done enough. So where does it end? So what you say is correct and it really applies to, to our project. Mm -hmm. The believability is exactly the, the, um, the common ground. Yeah. Now, from what, I, from what I've been able to tell, from what I've been able to tell, there's, there's quite a few extensive changes to the core to the core format one of the ones i wanted to get into is notoriety hmm. um how did that how did that particular mechanic come about yeah uh you know the point was also like, like while playing we also realized that those people uh people of our setting they are people that have to um, make space in, into the society or also try to survive, they do not rely on combat skills. They rely on social interactions um, on what they do, what the people they come around, uh, how wealthy they are. And I also wanted to include all these details about a character inside a number, which is the notoriety. Notoriety is this number, it's in percentage. Uh, everyone starts with the notoriety, depending on the class. And while you go uh, through the game and you, you, you basically increase your notoriety automatically by level, it's 1% per, for each level, but also according to what you do. And you can also choose to have a low profile to not actually increase your notoriety. This is uh, became cool when you basically go somewhere and, and it, with this mechanic, you can actually be recognized because the narrator, which is the, basically the GM of the game, as to throw for the notoriety. Mm -hmm. And if you get basically recognized, you can be recognized for the good things you did or for the bad things you did or for what people keep saying about you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so every action, uh, every character actions matter because that can affect your notoriety and the way you are, you are seen into the society. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was basically the, 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 the wall, basically the wall story around the notoriety mechanic. Yeah. And I'm guess I know that it's list it's stated that the notoriety increases by one percent at each level up, but I'm guessing that there are other increases at GM discretion. Yeah. GM discretion and also according to character features, class features. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, for example, features they are more exposed to the society. For example, the noble, uh, and, and there are features that allow the noble to increase notoriety. So in a different way. So there are different ways to increase notoriety. Yes, it's not just an yeah. automatic numbering. Um, now the other thing, the other thing that I no that I noticed is, I'm no I'm no stranger to seeing to seeing new classes or new archetypes in campaign in campaign modules. Hmm. But in the case of medieval, there's certainly a, there's certainly a lot more. Um, yeah, it's all. In fact, let me let me see. Three, six, eight. Okay, it's not as it's not as many classes as ba as basic, but mm -hmm. it but it is it is still it is still extensive. Um, yep. And if I can do a bit of a lightning, if I can do a bit of a lightning round, I'd like to I'd like to go into each and just kind of get the feel for what that particular class brings to the table in a broad sense. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And I'd like to start with the scholar. Yeah, that's actually the <laughs> the one that I like the most. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the scholar is someone that is basically uh that has started and and uh, has like a big knowledge and he can actually put this knowledge to other people help and and, and disposal. Mm -hmm. the, the scholar starts with uh, a range of um, things that he or she knows and uh, in, in different aspects, for example, mathematics, philosophy, uh, or for example, uh, a mechanic, uh, it really it's just a bunch of stuff. So basically you have points that you can spend on information 
level by level. And once you acquire new knowledge, you have a, the special a special mechanic related to it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if it's, if we, the FIFA player decided to 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 focus his scholar on the physic, for example, mm -hmm. starts to acquire a broad range of knowledge with regards the fly of an object, the fly of an arrow. He can be also able to tell you where the arrow, uh, like if it, uh, according to the wind, how your arrow would be shooting and, and, and gives the other player some bonuses if he is able to share this information with them. Mm -hmm. And another good thing is, uh, I, can, I can share this, this uh, feature of the scholar with you, he's able to have critical hit on ability as well, which is in the fifth edition applies just to the, the combat mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically the scholar is able to, to crit an ability when he makes an ability check um, with 20 and at higher level, even 19 or 18, which is uh, an old mechanic that we also saw in the 3.5, if, you, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Scholar is, is super nice. Uh, archetypes also, I, I can't share much about archetypes because it's something we're still working on it, but I can tell you that if you want to do, uh, for example, an, an alchemist, uh, it's an archetype. If you want to, mm -hmm. for example, work with herbs and be a professional uh, potion maker, you can, you, you can work, you, you can have an archetype with the Scholar and uh, and so on. It's very, it's very broad, and then uh, it's basically related on the, on the culture and mm -hmm. the sharing of information with other people around. Yeah. So next would be the surgeon. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the surgeon is basically a healer, um, which is able to to treat your debilitating wounds. Uh, this classes, uh, I have to say that have they have an application a specific application for each of the new mechanics that we basically inserted in this new setting. That is, in, the new, in this new setting, you can find debilitating wounds. So basically, when you are hit at the end of your combat, if your hit points are below a specific threshold that we created, which is the danger threshold, then you have to make a, um, a constitution saving throw where you may have debilitating wounds. Debilitating wounds are... Uh, basically gives you uh, exhaustion levels, which are already in D&D, &D, but they are not that much used in the fifth edition. So we give them more space, especially in the debilitating wounds. The, the surgeon, which is basically the healer, um, is able to, to treat these wounds properly. Everyone can stabilize a wound, but just the healer is able to cure them definitely definitely So it's it's very crucial for the for the party. And also mm -hmm. it's able to to, to, to allow your hit points to increase in a different way. And, uh, and according to archetypes, they can also become more than just healer. They can become expert of the bodies. They can tell you as, as a member of his body, they can tell you how to hit better. To, it can indicate to you the proper body points where you can hit uh, uh, better and with uh, in, like in dealing more, more damage. And mm -hmm. all these kind of things. He can be an, ex an expert of the body. He can trick the body, his, his body, his own body, or other people's body, to to cross the limit, to be to do more athletic, to to do to to fight better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know all these kind of things. So it's an healer, but it's also an expert of the body at the 360 degrees. Yeah. So next would be next would be the fighter, which. Um... Everybody, everybody knows what the fight. Everybody knows what the fighter is. You know, you probably know about the pain of the feet or back in the three point five days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the fighter in this game is someone that fights, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. But I also so talking about more in general in the game. This game is kind of beyond the combat. Uh, the the fight, the, the, the fights, and then the combats in general are less frequent than. What we see in the in the common fifth edition and in D and D, mm -hmm. um, less frequent because it's more deadly. The the common sword deal more damage. The, the common weapon, sorry, deal more damage, um, and uh, and then you need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. uh, you may also decide not to join a fight that you cannot win. So because that's basically what Middle Ages was. Um, but sometimes there is need to fight, uh, and in that in that so basically in that point. You want to have a fighter close by. The fighter mm, is just, you know, progress uh, the levels 
acquiring new skills, new combat skills, and the, the new um, um, proficiencies. Uh, I, I couldn't get the word. So new proficiencies for new weapons and for new protections. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also have to say that because this game is not just about combat, even the fighter does not just combat. For example, in the Middle Ages, having a sword uh, at your side, it's also a signal for the other people by the social point of view and, and the power and the well, how, wealth, how wealthy you are. In this game, sometimes having a sword at your side does the job, does the job to avoid the combat, does the job to say who you are, and, and sometimes and often there's no need to go over it. Um, so, the, so the fighter has also a lot of features that are basically um, are important to show his power to the people. For example, there is a new feat, which is called Scare, uh, scare Away, uh, you basically do an intimidation check against a saving throw on, on wisdom, and once in a day you can scare people, uh, you can scare people off like with your weapons. And, and the fighter is very good in doing this, and mm -hmm. in particular, he is also uh, not affected by this effect when someone else is trying to scare him with the weapons. So weapons are scary objects in this game, very scary objects they do the job even when you are not using them and the, and the fighter is is very um the, the, the fighter is very is very good in doing this mm -hmm. so that brings me to the arcanist yeah yeah so the arcanist is basically uh this new class that incarnates the esotericism mm -hmm. of the world setting uh, this brings me to the fact that i probably should mention that uh, this is a low magic setting Mm -hmm. uh, where magic in the real like in, in the real fact does not exist, but people in the Middle Ages believe it, believe it, believe in it a lot. So mm -hmm. this makes uh, gives a power to this. So what I want to say is that the, there is a, a kind of distinction between between the player that is sitting at the table and knows that the magic does not exist and knows that everything that uh, so, uh, supernatural that happened in the game is is in is actually a suggestion. It's, it's the effect of suggestion or tricks, but the the characters itself believes it. And mm -hmm. when you play it, you play as the magic exists. You play as God is putting his hands on you, or you play it as oh, there is a demon in this house for real that we need to cast away. Uh, Arcanist basically works around all these mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, he can cast wonders. Uh, wonders is basically the, the what, whatever uh, supernatural you want to do at the game tables. You, you basically you invent it yourself. Uh, you invent an effect, a magic effect, mm -hmm. and the narrator gives it a score uh, from one to five on how hard it is to to do this effect in the real life, in the real world. And then the 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 player has to make an an. Uh, a suggestion check, which is a new ability that we introduce, which goes under uh, the char the um, uh, the charism uh, uh, characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so yeah, that's the arcanist is basically it can be it can be you know uh, a, a crazy person or it can be simply a pagan that believes in his own god and believes that he can do magic. Mm -hmm. uh, also, according to when you play it, if you are if you are basically in the low Middle Ages or late Middle Ages, you you will see that the Arcanist is quite different. Uh, mm -hmm. The archetype of the Arcanist are very interesting. We have basically uh, the the sorcerer, the green sorcerer, which basically relate to the the natural magic, which is more close to the pagan culture. And then we have the white sorcerer, which is which takes care of the the white magic, so how to heal people, how to cast the demons away. And then we have the black sorcerer, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is a, a necromancer, basically. So he works on the uh, with the death. Uh, mm -hmm. He's able to extrapolate information from the dead body, or even use uh, dead body parts to make other rituals uh, and uh, in other weak actions. Mm -hmm. Now that brings me to the explorer. Yeah. So the explorer. So Explorer, um, I need to mention that in this game we have a new journey mechanics mm -hmm. uh, that rely a lot on, uh, on on path that you can take when you basically decide to go to a point to another in, in, on the map. So you need to choose a path, an itinerary. 
um, you want to follow the mountains or you want to follow the woods and here there are more animals that are uh, stats uh, and you need to plan your journey ahead very well because otherwise you may end up somewhere else and you can get robbed or mm -hmm. you can get killed by animals or freezing to death or starve. Uh, so it's very, very important that everyone in the party knows how to move around. The explorer is the best in doing so. And this also mm, makes uh, the important point that each class is crucial. I mean, according to the mechanics that we have in this setting, you cannot have everything inside your party. Uh, no. If you miss the explorer, uh, you you have troubles walking around. But then you can take the you can take the explorer and you miss the healer. Okay, then you have trouble in healing yourself. So it's not possible to have everything. That's why also this game is in a higher um, um, difficulty. Let's say it's more competitive. Mm -hmm. Talking about the explorer, yeah. So the explorer knows how to move around, how to prepare well for uh, for a journey, and it also knows more. Path, you know, every the, the group always know a single path. You know, the common the common itinerary to go to point A to point B. Explorer mm -hmm. knows generally one or two more, so it brings into the group new possibility for new routes, safer routes sometimes, and also uh, and it, also it knows how to go around, how to hunt. Uh, but among the archetype, there is, for example, uh, the one that takes care takes care of the animals, knows where they are, it knows how to fight them. Um, you know, this kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, after that would be the peasant. Yeah, so the peasant is the, the commoner. Uh, it is, the, let's say, it represents the majority of people of Middle Ages. We're talking about people of uh, people, people of the the, the 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 city. They are inside the cities or outside the cities, but what they do is uh, they they uh, create a lot of social interaction. They are very social. And uh, to bring up the new mechanics related to the peasant is the friendship that we, you guys can read in the quick start guide. So friendship is very important in the game. So you, you may start, according to your class, you may start the game with a friend. So you decide who this friend is. It's basically a non-playing character that the, 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 the player can decide to have as a friend from the beginning and you're just assured that everything you ask to this friend is trying to to help you as much as possible mm -hmm. uh, well the, the the peasant starts with uh, with the friend or sometimes with two friends according to the uh, cultural background and that's very important because they are generally very connected with society they can tell what's going on in the city if you just go around for a bit uh, and um, there are different archetypes. It is the, the archetype which makes the, 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 the peasant stronger, so he's able to carry weight around or to do athletics mm -hmm. very well. And there is the one which is instead very curious, and uh, and, and, and they and this is kind of is a peasant, but is is trying to learn a lot from the world and from the people. You can go around, you can sneak around very well. You can uh, basically try to to. To, um, to disguise, you know, the, from some um, pretending to be someone else, uh, they are very, very versatile as a character, uh, the uh, as a class. Sorry, the peasant is one of my favorites as well. Mm -hmm. um, so next would be the votary. Yeah, the votary. So votary is is uh, the, the religious, basically the religious person, uh, and this is the second class that makes the use of suggestion. And there are two classes that make use of suggestion, which are Arcanists with the cast of Wonders, and there is a Votary. The Votary is, uh, it can mm, it can be, okay, when we talk about Votary, we talk about someone that is a follower of one of the three main monotheistic religions. So talking about Christians, uh, Jews, and, and Islam. So when you when you start, you decide to be, to follow one of these. Uh, religion, which uh, is different from the Arcanists. It, when, when you play the Arcanists, you can both play a pagan, or you can both, or you can play, for example, um, just uh, j just someone that knows about esotericism in the late Middle Ages. So mm -hmm. it's very versatile. With the Votary, you play suggestion through the religion, and as the, the Arcanist is able to cast wonders, the Votary is able to cast divine signs. Mm -hmm. So divine science is the, one of the most important uh, feature of the votary. Is basically 
he asks for God to reveal himself, to, to give a sign, to do something. And, and uh, you, uh, you can't do it always. There is a limitation, of course. But mm-hmm. these effects are very, very powerful. It also relies on suggestion because everything that happens uh, in the game is, is a matter of suggestion. But this is also up to the player, actually, to interpret it. this. You can mm-hmm. also don't do it this way. But anyway, so you, um, you can cast a different signs and you can give a signal to people around you and which generally are very, very powerful. For example, you can um, you call a divine sign, then the narrator makes something appear like a wind uh, coming in and moving objects as as, uh, as God's will, and they mm-hmm. can be very powerful. Uh, talking about the archetype, um, you can fight. You can fight uh, uh, the evil with the exorcist, or you can be one of the priests that go around talking to people, so you're working more on the social aspect. Or mm-hmm. even you can be the uh, an, an asset. So basically, the, 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 those, the, the, those religious that uh, flog themselves and uh, through the flogging and through the suffering and through the study, acquire more visions and more power. Mm-hmm. So it's very broad. And it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, then would be the noble. And the con- the context of what a noble is 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 something that doesn't need explanation, but more yeah. but I'd more focus on what this particular take on the noble would bring. Okay, so noble, uh, the noble is a wealthy person. Of course, it starts with more resources of different kinds. Not talking not just talking about golds, but also about people that is able it, it, people that would do what he ask, which is not exactly friendship. Let's let's make a distinction here. Friendship is someone you can trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a noble has no friend. So you choose to be a noble and to be wealthy, but you don't have to trust people. And uh, But at the same time, a noble in a party is very, very useful because it gets a lot of resources as horses, money, uh, properties, uh, and also n- n- notoriety is quite high, so it can be recognized, and uh, which is good or what is bad, according to where you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's basically the noble. Share all the resources with, with the other people is very well respected. Uh, and, and the archetype are very, uh, are very cute, because in this case, you can be a knight, uh, in case of a noble that is also able to fight and acquired uh, a special place in the society or also you can be a noble which is connected to the church mm-hmm. uh, and, and handle yourself a monastery or handle yourself uh, for example uh, a, um, a house in the field you ha- you may have your own people working for you under yourself uh, so it it's all it all related around resources and how you as a noble share these resources with the other member of your party so you can mm-hmm. be very useful yeah. Um, now, next would be artist, which yeah. is an interest. Artistry is an interesting is an interesting position because a lot of people would think artistry is the kind of stuff that'd be in museums and the like. But um, no. around this time, around this time, and even throughout the and even through the Renaissance, um, artistry was was just was just something that was um, commissioned to do instead instead mm. of something some sort of um, high concept thing. Yeah, yeah. So to be to be uh, accurate here, I also need to say that when you imagine those these classes, you have to imagine them not in a specific period of the Middle Ages, which is generally the late Middle Age. Mm-hmm. When you imagine these classes, you need to imagine them across the wall Middle Age, which is very different from point to point. Uh, so this these classes they can be very different if you bring them in the sixth century or if you bring them in 14th century uh, so when you when you think about an artist you always think about someone is playing songs or is uh, basically working on commissions which is something late middle age um, so what we try to do and that was the big challenge we tried to transform these classes in something that you can actually apply to whatever a period of the Middle Ages, and it, this was not easy. So, talking about talk, talking about the artists, the artists, uh, everything of the artists goes around the communication. So, the way the character communicates with the other, um, and uh, they start with the masterpiece that they have, which can be a song, which can be a painting, which can be whatever they create. It can even be a story if they are storyteller, which is an archetype. 
uh, they have masterpiece. They give names to this opera um, that mm -hmm. they have, um, and they can they can show them. If it's a song, means they can play them whenever they want. If it's a painting, it means they can show them whatever they want, or they can paint in front of people, uh, and they go around through the level collecting these masterpieces and doing a lot with them. So, uh, so they are also able to communicate with. The, uh, for example, there is a there is an um, there is a feature of the artist that makes him more able to communicate with the wealthy people mm -hmm. when you go in front of the king. If you are, uh, if you are, for example, a peasant, you talk. Okay. If you're noble, you can talk more and better. But if you're an artist, you can really make this king understand what you're talking about. You can even make him hearing what you heard, uh, see what you saw uh, through through the art. So mm -hmm. it's it's very very interesting. Yeah. Now, then we have the merchant, which. I have I have my I have a few guesses on on how the merchant would work here, but I'm curious your take. Yeah, yeah. Well, merchant is uh, okay. So it's important to specify that in this setting is important. Mm -hmm. the, the the object the common objects are are, are very important. Um, everything relies around your equipment. When you have a sword, or even when you have a coin that you found. Uh, or you have a little wooden object that's not expendable. It's it's important, uh, and also we have. Uh, you can see in the character sheet, the new character sheet. You can see that there is actually a space for object for you to describe what they are. Uh, wh where did you find them? What's the emotional uh, around it? Uh, and uh, this brings me to the merchant. There is basically someone that is able to to. Uh, is someone that knows a lot about objects is able to evaluate them, is, is able to sell them at an higher price as if he wants. And it's also is able to not get deceived by someone who's trying to sell you something at a higher price and so on. But also uh, talking about the archetypes, the merchant can also um, go around with the, with the, with the chart and, and sell their own stuff. You know, they can buy things somewhere and they can sell things somewhere else. It's more of a, uh, if it's an handling kind of game mm -hmm. when we talk about the merchant. So, um, and, and with the progression of the level, you may you may uh, qualify more in in a, in a, in, a, in a particular type of go, uh, of good, mm -hmm. and you can sell those goods under your name and be very very wealthy yeah. as the level progress. Mm -hmm. Now, lastly, would be the scoundrel, which the scoundrel, yeah. I can I can infer is somewhat analogous to a rogue, but yeah, I'm scoundrel is basically mm -hmm. kind of a of a rogue. I didn't want I didn't want to be too specific on the rogue because, as I said, we are trying to to make this class to make you apply this class uh, in a thousand year history. Um, so the, the, the scoundrel is something, someone that knows how to go around, knows how to to, to disguise, to do uh, stealth, to stealth check properly, and, and sometimes they have guiles. So basically, they have internal groups that they can rely to, and they also have, may have a lot of friends. Uh, so the, the scoundrel is basically like the rogue. Uh, but applying it to the Middle Ages um, thing, you can imagine the scoundrel as a normal bandit that you can you can meet on the road. So scoundrel is not is not necessarily someone uh, wise or someone um, noble uh, at all. In fact, so you can uh, you can be uh, um, a bandit on the on the road, for example, and uh, and uh, and do this kind of thing. So when you when you when you meet a bandit, you can be sure that's a scoundrel as a class. Uh, mm -hmm. So according to the archetype, you can specialize more to to do stealth actions, or you can specialize more into uh, robbing, for example, in stealing, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and also uh, sell things around uh, and all these kind of things. Yeah. I I will admit I I was half tempted to to reference get to reference Garrett when it came to the when it came <laughs> to the scoundrel, Garrett? but that is yeah, yeah. but that is my own biases because I look because I have a particular fondness for the for at least two of the thief games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, 
one one thing that I did find kind of interesting is put is you guys putting a bit more a bit more emphasis on degrees of exhaustion, which is a pre which exhaustion has been present in D and D over the years, but it's but it's always been one of those effects that's in a bit of a back burner. Yeah. Yeah, but this is actually true for many other mechanics in 5th edition that at certain points are not used or, you know, as you say, put in the back, uh, on the back, yes. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, now, when it comes to, when it, came, when it came to the whole thing of debilitating wounds, was that, was that more to add to the um, groundedness that you guys are going for? Uh, it's you know the story about the building wounds is to go through the realism of the game. So we we we're trying to reproduce as much as possible what what happened in the, the reality or what happened back then when you get hit by a sword. Uh, most of the time you have the building wounds if you have if you get hit very hard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the natural effect of the building wounds is not just reducing hit points. That happens already. But it is the psychological effect or even the energy effect on your body that you have a wounds which may get infected because there is infection as well. Mm -hmm. um, so how to translate this psychological effect, let's say this is a secondary effect of the wounds in this fifth edition. We try to use, some, use things that were already there in the fifth edition and try to be more conservative as possible and mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, exhaustion level made actually the job very, very nicely, especially during the play test. I also want to remember that uh, the bleeding wounds are also when unarmed, they, are, they, can, they can be dealt with an armed strike. That mm -hmm. sounds crazy, but when you get an unarmed strike, you, have, you, you, you get dizzy if you, if you got it in your head, for example, or if you had a punch in your stomach. Uh, and that's exactly what the building, uh, sorry, what uh, uh, extortion level means. The, the, the extortion level you get with an armed strike, they disappear in a minute. So this is something that happened during the uh, the round of combat and also just uh, during the fight. Mm -hmm. They are different from the the uh, extortion level you get when you when you have a debilitating wound. Just to be just to be clear. Yeah. Um, but the whole the whole thing is that the building wounds are already there in the fifth edition. They look nice to us, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then they work very nice in the playtest as well. Yeah, and something that I, something that is do, is done here that I do find interesting is there are some there are some games that f that feel that in or in order to maintain a groundedness they have to cap the um, leveling system, whereas mm -hmm. from what I'm seeing with you, with with the um, class examples that you give, you guys are going with the full twenty level spiel. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we actually thought about it. We the, uh, the original idea was to stop at the fifth level. Uh, the the point is that the whole paradigm change in in medieval and being twenty in the level just means you are super strong, as in D and D. So in D and D, you basically became a god when you are level twenty. That's not like this. That's exactly not like this in the in, two, in medieval. You die at first level, and you can die at the twenty level as well if you are not careful. Mm -hmm. So the level progression here just means uh, um, you acquire new skills related to your class, uh, and that means you become stronger in the sense of D and D. That means you don't die anymore. So mm -hmm. taking away this D and D paradigm, you you have to see medieval tales from Europe has uh, um, a progression which is first of all faster uh, with the new basically with the new um, experience uh, point mechanic which is not point but it's, it's, it's based on on stones that you acquire uh, um, you, you need to see this as a, as a normal knowledge progression which is faster and doesn't mean that people get super super strong you know in mm -hmm. this optic uh, the, the 20 level made sense and I hope you one day you will see the, uh, the 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 features, all the features of the class, and you can see that they don't bring the character to a super strong point mm -hmm. at all. But it does it just make it more fun to have more things to do 
um, and it's uh, it worked very well. Yeah. Uh, when I looked through the equipment list, one particular thing that I've there's a there's a few tags that I find interesting. Hmm. Um, one of them one of them being that being things like poor parry or or impo yeah. or impossible parry. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Of you you ask this. Which allow me to introduce a new mechanic of combat, which is called parry. Mm -hmm. uh, being the combat more deadly doesn't mean you die uh, faster than in the indie, uh, because also here you have to. Um, we we introduce basically a new mechanic, which is the parry, which means that you use your reaction to parry, uh, and when you use your reaction to parry, you you roll a hit roll against the original hit roll. And if it's compared or higher, then you you basically you parry the hit. You can parry in whatever way you want. You can parry with a weapon, which is the most common parry. Mm -hmm. You can parry with your unarmed, you know, with, with your arms. But in that case, you do not neutralize the attack of a, of a sword because it deals damage anyway. But you can mm -hmm. still parry if you want. And you can parry with shields, which are the 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 most important. Uh, protection to use to parry because when you parry with shields you have advantage in your heat roll for the parry so it's very easy to uh, to parry with the shield actually mm -hmm. um, so some weapon has this this proper property which is called poor parry which means you have disadvantage to the heat roll that you do while parrying um, and this is, um, is is due to the fact that some weapons are very uh, and inappropriate to parry, or some of them are even not uh, capable of parry. For example, the bow, if you see at the bow, it has a property which is called impossible parry. It means you cannot use your bow to parry. So this is basically saying how good you are at parry while you are keeping that weapon. So poor mm -hmm. parry, disadvantage, good parry, advantage. Impossible parry means you cannot parry with that weapon. Mm -hmm. Now, the other one that I, the other one, of course, that I saw that, that I found interesting is impact. Hmm. Yeah. Is uh, impact is the mechanic of the mace. Um, you know, that's true in the Middle Ages. Basically, uh, um, there are some weapons that they, de they developed later uh, during the Middle Ages period, and also they developed according to the protection development. So better the protection, better the weapon against those protection. And when you are in the 14th century and you have this full armor, um, you, have, you have this full armor uh, fighter, when, and, and you try to hit him, can be hard. But if you do it with the proper weapon, then it can be easier. And this is the case of the mace with the property of impact, which are able to deal more damage when they hit someone in armor. Because basically, you release more cinetic energy on the wall body, in this case, on the wall armor, and you are able to deal more damage. So weapons are, they take count of this, uh, uh, of the new characteristic of the weapons, of these new features, while you play adventures uh, closer to the late Middle Ages period. Mm -hmm. Plus, I, I do, rec from what I do recall with my st with my studies, a lot of impact weapons ended up becoming more and more of a thing as more and more people, um, whether whether knights or otherwise, started using armor. Yes, yes, they, yes you couldn't exactly. cut. You can't. You couldn't cut with, especially with full plate. Yeah, you no. can't cut through that. No. But um, it's not. But and also it, the yeah yeah no, just, just go ahead. It'll it'll be it'll um it'll it'll block some it'll block some of the impact, but physics. Will still be a factor with tr when it comes to all of the internal damage. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Another point is also horse fighting, uh, which is um, which is very characterized in our game, mm -hmm. um, and also it becomes more and more important while you play into the late Middle Ages period. Um, you know, I would say fighting is not that common into the game, but it can happen, and when it happens. We like the fact that the players could find a broad range of of, uh, of uh, weapons and uh, and mechanics to deal with it properly, and uh, horse horse fighting, for example, uh, is uh, is is one of these. Mm -hmm. Now, just.
just cu just curious, but have you get have you guys given consideration to putting putting in rules for festivals or the like? Hmm. Well, to be honest, uh, I thought about it as a, a supplement that I, we may release in the future uh, after the, 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 the sharing of the core book. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and as I said, as a supplement where you can basically have historical information, how festival were carried out and how you can participate in everything. This is something really, really fun that uh, we didn't play test yet, but uh, this is something on the list for sure. Mm -hmm. I now, with that with that in mind, um, are you get, are you guys gearing up for a full release there? Do you get are you gearing up for a um for a Kickstarter launch late yeah. um later down the line? Yeah, we are heading for a Kickstarter campaign, which uh, which will be launched at the end of the summer, beginning mm -hmm. of autumn, let's say twenty twenty two. I can't be more accurate in this because uh, we still need to see a few things, but that's basically the period. Yeah. So uh, then we will keep working on the project for a bit after the, the campaign, and then we will be able to, to deliver a complete product, which in this case will be the core book, uh, and also for sure an adventure of uh, um, an adventure in the 14th century, which is called The Curse of the Last Templar, mm -hmm. uh, which talks about the, 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 the order of the Templar and, uh, and their defeat, so how they escaped exactly that period. Uh, so for sure, there will be these two deliverables. Um, I can't say much about the rest, uh, but I can just say, you know, guys, you keep following the Facebook page, you will be informed as soon as we know it. Mm -hmm. oh. Since you mentioned since you mentioned module, that bring that brings me to a question that I've explored in a in a recent video on my channel, and that that deals with. Um, so with support for low and high and um, high level, which is something that D that um even D that D and D fifth edition, at least when it comes to the core material, kind of struggles with. You know, a lot of a lot of support for the low levels, not so much for the high levels. Um, yeah. Do you... What you mean? You mean support in a sense that um, uh, helps you in the game to to not get defeated, or or what do you mean with the support? Um, it's more su it's more support for GMs in terms oh, of in okay, terms of I, in terms of setting up and setting up encounters yeah. for high levels just as much for low levels. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so concerning the 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 GM mm -hmm. in the core book, there will be a full session, which is dedicated just to the narrators, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that that chapters explore a broad range of uh, advice and hints on how to play medieval tales from Europe properly in the in, in the easiest way. So there is, there would be support for GM in the core book. So mm -hmm. when you get the core book, you have this too. The, the core book will be almost 300 pages. Uh, mm -hmm. So you will get everything in one in one book. Then yeah. we may have supplements. I don't know if you guys if you, if you know, but we had a, we had a previous Kickstarter campaign in 2019, 2020, where you where we released with the core book also a little supplement um, which was called Enemies Encounters, which talks about the encounters, how you encounter your enemies, the different kind of enemies, I'm talking about humans or animals, different kind of humans, if it's just a, a peasant or it can be the, the different warriors across the, the, the centuries um, and other, other strange things that I, I don't want to mention. For example, there is this uh, this new thing that we we basically focused on a lot that we called round actions, which are actions similar to combat where you roll for initiative, but the real threat is not a human or is not an animal. The real threat can be things moving around that you have to be fast. For example, something is falling down, the ceiling is falling down, you need to get out of it. Uh, at the same time, there are other things going on round per round. So this is called round actions. Mm -hmm. it, it's similar to the the... The, the mechanics, the, the, sorry, the traps, the mechanical traps you have to fight in 5th edition where you basically roll for initiative and you fight against this trap. Um, and there will be, so in this uh, in enemies encounter, there will be also non-human and non-animal threat, let's say non-life non threat. Uh, um, this, if we will decide to release this uh, um, enemy encounters, there will be this in as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what, now, um, 
With that Kickstarter camp, with that campaign, are you guys planning on going a um, thirty day run? Uh, yeah, probably. But uh, honestly, I don't wanna. I don't want to say something that's not true. This is still on the table. It's most likely, but uh, I don't want to say hundred mm-hmm. percent. Now, uh, and I will certainly be keeping a close eye on, on this kind of thing. Um, it is it is kind of funny that that um, that this that the direction that this is going is one that is one that I've seen certain tables um, start to start to dip into off and on over the over the last few years. But I will admit my own biases in re- in researching on that because I go a lot of places. I go a lot of places with my research, but I'm not an immortal caveman, and, and it's a big damn world out there. <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. And you also, you, I have to say, you 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 gave me the, the the chance to first of all speak in English to our followers. Uh, we are releasing the game in in Italian, both Italian and English. Mm-hmm. And I also, you know, this was important for me to 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 try to speak them directly, not through subtitles. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to say, I have to admit, you gave me this very good chance. So thank you very much. Yeah, and if i'm not sh- i'm not sure how much of my previous work you've seen but i'm no s- i'm no stranger to talking with italian gamers <laughs> <laughs> okay no that's i didn't know i have to admit uh, but anytime you see fit to return to the temple the door is always open as i often cool. say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> okay thank you very much yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and bet and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>